Hello, and thank you for, for joining us today for this event, uh, side event to the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Barker, and I serve as the Middle East Action Team Director for the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, for those who, who don't know about RFI, our mission in part is uh, to advance religious freedom for everyone, everywhere. And we do that through a number of initiatives, um, geographically focused in areas uh, such as the Middle East, North Africa, and South and Southeast Asia, um, as well as in strategic uh, topical areas like um, education and international religious freedom policy um, and the intersection of Islam and religious freedom. Um, joining me today, um, are a num some fantastic uh, friends and colleagues um, who are working on, on a vital aspect of religious freedom, which is the intersection between uh, religious freedom and, and humanitarian relief and international development, and particularly um, framed around the sustainable development goals. Um, so I look forward to, to getting to introduce them to you in just a moment. Um, I'll just say a, a brief word about the, the framing of the event, the, um, focused on this idea of vulnerabilities in a blind spot. Um, and this is, has come from extensive work that we've been doing around the world, including um, where I am, am now tonight in, um, in the Kirby Rock, and where we've seen uh, religious minorities that have faced um, acute violence in many ways, and yet the identification, the response to that, um, in some cases has been somewhat in a blind spot for policymakers, for practitioners, and we want to explore um, this question of, of what are some of the, the reasons that that might be the case, and then how that might be resolved, uh, both for policymakers as well as practitioners. And so joining me today um, in that conversation, I um, have a privilege to have with us uh, Ms. Rebecca Shaw, uh, Professor Jerry, as well as uh, Mr. Salah Ali, um, uh, joining me from around the corner here in, in Iraq. Uh, Rebecca Shaw in South Asia and Professor Powers in, in South End. Um, and each of them has, has done extensive work in this, both in the the academic and thought leadership space, as well as in, in practical areas. And so um, we'll just say a brief word about each of them. Uh, Professor Jerry Powers is the director of the Catholic Peacebuilding Studies uh, for the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Rebecca Shaw, among other things, is the principal investigator for the Religion and Economic Empowerment Project, um, development economist who's done extensive work um, in many areas, especially South South Asia, uh, and then uh, Salah Ali, who's um, also involved in many things, but is serving as the general coordinator of the Iraq Religious Freedom Roundtable um, here in the country of Iraq. So welcome to each of you, and to get us started and, and frame this conversation in a lot of ways, um, uh, Becky, please take us away. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, and... Uh... I, I, I'd be very grateful if you could start those PowerPoints uh, uh, which, uh, which I gave you. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Religious Freedom Institute for this excellent event. Uh, and I entitled my talk today, Protecting the Religious Freedom of Vulnerable Minorities in Development and Humanitarianism. I'm going to be uh, talking very briefly about three main aspects uh, of uh, protecting the religious freedom of vulnerable minorities. The first one is I'm going to ask why is it important to protect the, uh, the vulnerable uh, religious minorities? What are the barriers to protecting vulnerable religious minorities? And how do we address the needs of these vulnerable religious minorities? So next slide, please, Jeremy. Why is it important to protect and assist vulnerable religious minorities? The first reason is because it is urgent and practical. In cases of conflict and statelessness, the ones most affected are minorities. UNHCR 
acknowledges, and I believe this was in 2017 or 2018, so not long ago, that of the 72 million stateless people, 75% of them are part of minority groups. Protection of vulnerable minorities can lead to a more prosperous and peaceful society. This is, of course, at the heart of the work of uh, a very uh, interesting and profound scholar, Nile Seya, in Singapore, whose work, Weapons of Peace, empirically shows that religiously free societies are more prosperous and peaceful. Which, of course, begs the question, what is happening to countries like Burma or Turkey or even India, where I am, where the country is systematically seeking to eradicate their vulnerable religious minority communities. Another reason is that religious minority identity renders these communities particularly vulnerable to post-crisis delivery of humanitarian and development assistance. These communities either fall through the cracks or are deliberately overlooked. Now, the second reason why it's important to protect and assist uh, vulnerable religious minorities is because these minorities are often at risk of immediate and grave violence. The risk of immediate and grave violence is exacerbated for these communities in crisis situations. In most cases, these communities were already vulnerable even before a crisis or conflict. Sects that were considered heterodox, for example, how ISIS viewed the Yazidis, where you are, uh, Jeremy, or converts from favored religions, often viewed as apostates deserving death, are those that we may place under this category of people at grave risk or at risk of grave violence. Soft targets, such as those being accused of blasphemy, like Asya Bibi, the very most famous case that comes to mind, these are also vulnerable religious minorities that are at risk of immediate and grave violence. The third reason as to why it is important to protect minorities is religious identity should be seen as a vulnerability criterion, especially when it has played a role in conflict. Now, need not creed is indeed an important and some might say a defining feature of humanitarian action. Need rather than creed should always drive humanitarian response, but let's not hide behind the system here demanding no discrimination on the basis of gender, nationality, race, or religion might actually prevent development and humanitarian action, actors from doing what they're supposed to do, alleviate suffering. The creed of the vulnerable compounds their need. In some cases, the creed of the vulnerable is the primary basis for a group's marginality and vulnerability. To ignore, overlook, or neglect the religious identity of groups here may prevent us from addressing the particular and unique needs of these vulnerable groups and leave them behind. Fourthly, it is important to protect and assist vulnerable religious min minorities because doing so can meet core developmental goals. Marginalized communities are often among the poorest in society. There are significant correlations between social, religious marginalization, and economic inequities. The world's per poor are not randomly distributed across the globe. Poverty is determined by numerous intersecting forms of discrimination and exclusion, including and particularly religiously motivated exclusion and discrimination. For example, Hindus in Bangladesh, Dalit Christians in Punjab in Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan cr Christian Chin communities in Myanmar, Muslim Rohingya in Myanmar as well, Dalit Muslims in India. In a project that I run, next slide please, Jeremy, which is the Religion and Economic Empowerment Project, we find that protecting the deeply held, personally appropriated religious beliefs and practices of individuals, as well as protecting the freedom of individuals to switch religious traditions, regardless of direction, can yield quantifiable pro-developmental, and pro-social outcomes. Next, uh, I guess Jeremy's gone. Um, the next slide, uh, please, Cecilia. If uh, The next slide, please, Jeremy. 
the slide with the data. It's okay, I can talk through it. With respect to SDGs, we find that protection of religious freedom is systematically related to various key dimensions of development. This is a large study that was done with thousands of people and it continues. It's being funded by the Templeton Religion Trust here in South Asia. And we find that protecting deeply held religious beliefs, as well as protecting the freedom of individuals to switch religious traditions, regardless of direction, empowers and equips people, particularly the poor, to build resilience and reduce exposure to economic and social shocks. That is SDG goal 1.5. Reducing inequality and promoting enterprise by identifying low interest loans for businesses. Uh, these people whose we have, we see a strong association between protecting the religious freedom, protecting the religious freedom of these individuals and their ability to uh, know the interest rate, own a business, uh, smoke less, use less violence to control their wife. These are all pro-social and pro-familial, pro-developmental outcomes. The next slide, please, Jeremy. We also find that ensure that if you protect the religious freedom of these religious minorities, you can ensure a peaceful and inclusive community, as you see here. People whose, whose religious freedom is protected are more likely to be open to moving next door to someone, having someone of a different religion move next door, or being open to the possibility that someone might want to switch a religion. So there, we, we find this in our study. So I'm going to move to the next question, which is what are the barriers to protecting vulnerable minorities? The next slide, please, Jeremy. Development and humanitarian actors may not want to expose vulnerable minorities by singling them out. Religious minorities might be under threat even before a crisis. If there is a focus on these groups, it might exacerbate their vulnerable status and even trigger additional conflicts. For example, someone who was administering aid in the Rohingya camp in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, in the country next door, said that poor Buddhists were very angry because they felt left out of aid provision, whilst the Muslim Rohingya received aid. So this might trigger, by singling out a, a particular minority, it might actually uh, put a bullseye on their back. And aid agencies might not wish to do that. The minorities themselves might not want to make themselves more visible. That's the second point. And the third point is donors and humanitarian actors and recipients of aid might defer in their definition of what is essential and basic needs. On the one hand, while the goal of all humanitarian action is to adhere to the principle of neutrality, some faith-based organizations might wish to express their aims and motivations to care for vulnerable populations in explicitly religious terms, while others might interpret this as a departure from neutrality, a key principle, humanitarian uh, principle. On the other hand, secular humanitarian actors that aim to maintain impartiality at all costs might create a blind spot, the title of this event, around the particular features and needs of religious minorities and thus fail to address their distinct vulnerabilities. How do we serve these populations if we don't understand their distinct needs and vulnerabilities? If there is a blind spot around these particular needs, how do we reach those that are hardest to reach? The fourth barrier is some faith-based and humanitarian actors do not want to be seen as favoring their co-religionists. They may fear violating the humanitarian principle of impartiality. There are some large faith-based organizations in the West that are Christian, that are reluctant to help other Christians, particularly because they do not want to be seen as favoring their own co-religionists. And this is a barrier, a very real barrier. The third question that I ask, next slide please, Jeremy, is how do we address the needs of these vulnerable minorities? The first thing we do 
is we enforce active protections to safeguard minorities facing imminent existential risk of violence. Within minority populations, there are those that are high risk, such as children, women, converts, and sexual minorities. And these people, need, we need to pay particular attention to these groups and secure protection from violence. The second way we address the unique needs is by developing a more expansive understanding of basic needs for development and humanitarian actors. Focusing on economic disparities or material needs of a population does not address the root causes of discrimination and exclusion. Being left behind does not happen arbitrarily. Writing in the aftermath of World War II and drawing heavily on Catholic social thought, and I'm delighted that Professor Powers is here from Notre Dame, Dennis Goulet, the father of development ethics, who was of course at Notre Dame, warned that if modern economics, or in our case, modern day development and humanitarianism continue to ignore how the transcendent powerfully shapes how we act in a situation, then these institutions, these humanitarian actors, they act as one-eyed giants who analyze, prescribe, and act as if man could live by bread alone, as if human destiny could be stripped to its material dimensions alone. Aren't these powerful words? We need to challenge the idea of basic needs prescribed by some in the field of development and humanitarian work. For a lot of crisis-affected people, in addition to being fed and clothed and housed, they need assurances that their dignity is respected. They need hope. They need restoration of their houses of worship. They need the comfort of their family relationships. In some cases, religious groups, faith-based organizations, faith leaders may be able to do this better than aid workers, sectarian aid workers. The third way we address the unique needs is we step out of a Western mindset where religion is seen as part of the problem. Most Western donors, international NGOs, and it's sadly, some faith-based NGOs regard religion as a problem. These organizations deal with religion reactively, as opposed to integrating it proactively in the front end in a way that one conceives of religion in development and humanitarianism in the first place. Finally, we develop secure and sensitive means to collect disaggregated data. What gets measured gets done. In terms of SDGs, one of the most striking examples is that of target 10.2. I'll read it. By 2030, empower and promote the social, economic, and political inclusion of all irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, or economic and other status. The associated indicator for this target reads, and I quote, proportion of people living below 50% of median income by age, sex, and persons with disabilities. What happened to the other descriptors? Rate, race, ethnicity, and religion, or economic and other status was dropped. Now, is this an oversight or an accident? The reason for the exclusion is that there is tremendous power in the data. For example, if a group is categorized as a minority, it puts pressure on the whole state to care for this group. Are there risks in collecting disaggregated for already vulnerable and at-risk groups? Yes, there certainly are. And I'm not playing down those risks. But most religious people, most vulnerable religious minorities, often refer to themselves by virtue of their dress or other distinguishing characteristics as a religious community. Development and humanitarian actors might be able to provide protection to these groups and collect data at a community level in ways that protect their confidentiality and security. I know I've raced through this and I'm happy to unpack this during question time, but these are the three questions that we uh, have dealt with and you can read more about this in not only in the work that I do, but in the guidance note that was written, which Jeremy, I'm sure, will will go into, which we did for uh, as part of uh, the Religious Freedom Institute, but also which was commissioned by the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Development Office uh, in 2020. Thank you, Jeremy.
Oh, th thank you, Becky. And you raised but covered a lot of important ground that I think um, raised some some very useful questions that are at the heart of the conversation today. Um, as we turn to uh, to Professor Powers, uh, one of the questions you uh, you touched on right there. of reason seen as a part of the problem. And Professor Powers and colleagues at Notre Dame recently wrote a piece looking at the implementation of the Global Fragility Act um, that was recently passed and the role of religious engagement in that in the implementation of that. And so um, this question of, of how do we engage um, religious communities? Um, so Professor Powers, I, I turn it to you now to um, to take on these questions and, and to speak from, from your work. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for the Religious Freedom Institute for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my remarks are based on almost 18 years working on religion and foreign policy uh, for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And then I've been at, the, at Notre Dame for more than 16 years. And one of my uh, jobs in addition to teaching and writing is to coordinate the Catholic Peace Building Network which is a network of about two dozen Catholic institutions, universities, development agencies, Vatican agencies, and independent Catholic organizations. And we look for ways that we can collaborate uh, on peace building in different parts of the world. Um, I've also worked closely with several State Department committees that have focused on religious freedom and, and religion, conflict, and peace since 1988. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, my remarks are based on a recent uh, policy brief that Scott Appleby, uh, Ibrahim Musa, and I did on religious engagement in implementing the Global Fragility Act. You can find that on Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs website. The Global Fragility Act of 2019, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, is a potentially important means to implement the SDG goals because it mandates strategic coordination across the U.S. government on 10-year plans to strengthen its capacity to prevent violence and increase stability in fragile countries and regions. Uh, our simple thesis is that if the US government or other governments want to engage effectively to strengthen fragile states or regions, or more broadly to meet the SDG goals, religion is one of many factors they have to understand and find effective ways to engage. Uh, let me explain uh, several points. First, the idea that governments should engage religious actors and factors is hardly breaking news. After all, this webinar is tied to the third in a series of ministerials on religious freedom. The U.S. has been a leader among governments on the issue, especially since passage of the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act. Moreover, the U.S. government, like many governments and international organizations, has a long history of engaging quite effectively with faith-based relief and development agencies. But there is a blind spot when it comes of a sort, when it comes to the role of religion in conflict and peace building. And I say of a sort because uh, there is quite a bit of attention to this issue, especially since 9-11, and especially with regard to dealing with religious extremism and extremists such as Al-Qaeda and ISIL. Our concern is not so much that there's a blind spot on the issue, rather it is that the US government and other governments have, for the most part, not develop the capacity to engage religion in a systematic, sophisticated, appropriate, and effective way. There are, of course, examples of quite sophisticated and effective and appropriate engagement. As a general rule, however, the US government has not devoted the resources needed to understand and engage the complex dynamics behind both the negative role of religion in contributing to conflict, and that's real, as well as the positive role of religion in promoting peace justice, and freedom. When it does engage religion, it tends to engage religious actors as if they were just another NGO or political organization, and they engage on mostly short-term political or policy issues. What they tend to miss is that the principal role religious actors play is often in the realm of culture, not in not politics or policy. As Amitai Etzioni says, Religion is one source, in many cases a main source, and in some cases the major or exclusive source of moral culture. And religion can play an indispensable role in shaping a culture of peace and reconciliation 
that is so lacking in fragile conflict-torn countries that suffer from a culture of violence. My second point, when governments pay attention to religion, they often start with the question, how can the government help religious entities enhance their ability to promote peace? That's an important question, but it's not the most important and certainly not the first question for governments. The first question should be, what is the impact of our government's past, current, and proposed policies and programs on the religious dynamics in a conflict situation? Just as governments do environmental impact statements, perhaps they should do religious environment impact statements or assessments. A religious environment impact assessment starts with what I, what I noted in my first point, the ability to do a sophisticated understanding of religious dynamics. Guided by the principle do no harm, it then assesses how the governments can ensure that its policies and programs are not contributing to the very religious extremism that the government purports to be opposed to. Iraq and Syria are exhibit A in terms of what can go wrong when there is not a sophisticated understanding of religious dynamics or an adequate assessment of the impact of US policies on those dynamics. Even when programs are designed to address religious dynamics, such as public diplomacy programs aimed at countering religious extremism, the impacts have not always been positive. Uh, and this one reason is because these programs can be perceived even by so-called moderate, nonviolent religious actors as trying to remake the world in a Western secularist image. That only feeds the narrative of the religious extremists who claim to be protecting religious and cultural traditions from assault by the West. Third, how governments engage religious actors is critical. Too often, the goal has been to find religious partners or allies to advance US policy goals. The goal should not be to partner with religious allies, but to engage all religious actors in a way that contributes to peace and stability in the particular country or region. The government will not achieve its policy objectives or live up to its ideals if it unwittingly or wittingly uses religion as a tool of US foreign policy. It is critically important not to instrumentalize religion. Too often, US officials have placed unrealistic expectations on the capacity of religious leaders to deliver short-term political outcomes during a crisis. Especially in conflicts with the religious dimension, the government has sometimes helped convene religious leaders to support peace initiatives. Now, while the intention might be laudable, these efforts can be perceived as interference in the internal dynamics of religious actors and their interfaith relationships, and they might undermine the independence and credibility of the very religious actors who might have a role to play in promoting peace and reconciliation during that crisis. Governments can play a supporting role, but the main initiative has to come from the religious actors themselves, not the government. And those religious actors must draw on their own resources in their distinct ways and in their own timeframes if they are be to be successful peace builders. Fourth and finally, a basic, basic question in engaging religious actors is whether to do so on an interreligious basis or an intra-religious basis. For a variety of reasons, the default approach of US government policies and programs involving conflict and peace, this is not necessarily true of programs uh, involving aid and development, has been to engage primarily on an ecumenical or interreligious basis. A notable exception are programs engaging Islam. I've been personally engaged in numerous ecumenical and interreligious initiatives related to Northern Ireland, the Balkans, Israel, Palestine, and on various issues such as debt relief, landmines, and nuclear weapons. Interreligious peace building is critically important, but it offers, often suffers from a paradox. The more religion is central to a conflict, the greater the need for interreligious peace building, the less religion is central to the conflict, the greater the likelihood that interreligious peace building will actually bear fruit. The more religion is central to the conflict, the greater the need for interreligious peace building, the less religion is central to the conflict, the greater the likelihood that interreligious peace building will bear fruit. While it continues to engage on an interreligious basis, 
the government needs to be more open to intra-religious engagement. The peace-building power of religion does not come from religion in general, but from particular kinds of religion. That is, particular kinds of religious identities, spiritualities, beliefs, norms, and practices. In many conflict situations, the problem is not only, or even mostly, a lack of interreligious engagement. What often is needed much more are more Roman Catholic, more Baptist, more Sunni, more Shiite peace builders. Might by drawing on their distinctive spiritual, moral, pastoral, and institutional resources, these peace builders can gauge and or discredit the extremists within their own communities as they seek to mobilize their own communities on behalf of peace, freedom, and justice. So to summarize, develop the capacity to understand and engage religious dynamics. Don't ask how governments can make religious actors better, but assess how government policies impact religious dynamics. Don't look to partner with religious allies, but engage all religious actors and work on both in an religious and an intra-religious basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, and um, I, yeah, a lot of, of great practical insight. And um, to pick up on that, I'm I'm really pleased with with how the the conversation is flowing. Uh, our next speaker, Salah, um, has over the last six years been um, the front lines of many of these questions here here in Iraq in a. A program management role, social cohesion projects, um, and now in a leading a, a network that um, is by faith, but I think is aiming to cultivate some of that intra religious capacity as, as well. Um, so, Salah, uh, I turn it now to you to um, share with us from, from your experience. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's a great pleasure to meet uh, Professor and uh, Rebecca as well. It's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you. But uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the network, we just uh, established Iraqi Religious Freedom Roundtable at the beginning of this year. Uh, personally and, and collectively, we found out. I mean, the, the, the inside the Roundtable, we found out that there's a lack of uh, efforts uh, in relation to uh, promoting religious freedom in Iraq. And uh, uh, it is clear to, uh, I believe, all of you that uh, I mean, the, the restriction of religious freedom in Iraq, it was really costly. And uh, there was many incidents and violence, conflict violence that was uh, uh, because of restricting uh, religious freedom in the country. And the, the roundtable that has just been established at the beginning of this year and have uh, uh, different religious uh, leaders from different uh, religious group, uh, Christian, Baha'i, uh, Yazidi, Shia, and Muslim, Shia, and Sunni, and other religious that uh, we have in Iraq. And uh, so basically, the, the 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 main purpose of this roundtable is just to create a platform where people bring their expertise, uh, their knowledge, and their ideas in order to promote uh, religious freedom in Iraq. And uh, also, since then, we've been uh, working on expanding our network in Iraq uh, locally, nationally, and internationally as well, in order to bring as much as effort uh, from outside, lesson learned from other countries uh, uh, in order to promote religious freedom in Iraq. But uh, in general, as you know, Iraq has a unique uh, society that includes many religious and ethnic groups. Uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, this diverse aspect of the country, like uh, if I may say, like its natural resources such as oil, never been managed uh, uh, 
uh, properly by the government. And uh, uh, there's clear evidence that uh, the government was the one most of the time being pointed at as the as the violator and the violating religious and ethnic minorities' rights. Uh, if you look at the history of Iraq, you will find out easily that uh, different government throughout the modern history of Iraq has been uh, uh, using religious and ethnic outbidding policy, which means that uh, there was only one religion, one uh, ethnic that uh, the, the government uh, uh, raised and the, the rest uh, I mean, should have followed. Otherwise, they've been, the, the people and the religious groups and ethnic groups have been persecuted. In other words, we could say that the, 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 the government used the marginalization, favoritism uh, policies. So as a result of using this coercive policies, a, uh, the, 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 the main point is it, it didn't stop there by the government. It just came down to this society as well. So as a result, a trend, a trend among the, our society created that made pupil incline more to intolerance toward each other's religion and ethnic, uh, as well as uh, restricting religious freedom. And sometimes this hostility rose to a level of genocide. So, I mean, for those who just uh, have uh, studied or just uh, have knowledge about the, the, the Johann Galton and peace studies as well, I mean, we look at it that uh, uh, structurally, violence being used by the government, uh, and uh, culturally, people learned that it is normal to use those intolerant and uh, bullying other religious groups and other type of uh, uh, violence, whether it's whether it's direct or indirect, uh, and all this led to the the, the, the conflict violence uh, and uh, forcing lots of uh, religious groups in Iraq to leave, to either leave or, I don't know, or just to face the persecution in the areas. And particularly, as you know, that Yazidi, you've seen case of Yazidi, but there are other, I mean, uh, religious minorities such as um, Christian, who uh, they were about one and uh, almost half million people here in Iraq. Right now we have uh, about only between 200 to 300,000 people, which is really is quite shocking. Uh, and uh, and if it's the, the, the situation goes like that and continue, we may uh, not have uh, any more uh, uh, diverse religious uh, and ethnic minority groups like within 10 years or 15 years. So, I mean, this is also uh, the, the, the main point also here is about the anti-discrimination and uh, restricting religion freedom in Iraq. And this aspect, uh, we, did, uh, we conducted a study about religious freedom in Iraq. Basically, it's about a couple of months ago. And uh, we found out, uh, uh, so the, the study was about, uh, was about, uh, gouging public understanding on the nexus between religious freedom and achieving durable peace in Iraq. So the study showed that uh, only one third of the participants had positive uh, understanding of the concept of religious freedom. So imagine one third of the population. I don't say, we cannot generalize it because the, the study being conducted in about four or five uh, cities in Iraq, and, and, and I'm sure when you uh, expand and uh, the, the, the study, the result may be different, but uh, it won't be much different. <laughs> uh, uh, this is one thing. And the, the, the rest, uh, one third, as I said, that uh, 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 didn't understand it all, just had positive understanding. Oh, oh sorry, had only positive understanding. Uh, of the concept of religion, but the the, the rest had, uh, which is two thirds of the the the, the sample, uh, the the group, had uh, I mean held negative views uh, towards religious freedom, uh, and um, in fact half of this the two thirds uh, thought that it was uh, uh, had a strict view uh, against the term 
uh, itself uh, with some association uh, with some of uh, um, associating it with uh, practice such as targeting Muslim to illegitimately entice or coerce uh, uh, others to leave their religion. So this misunderstanding of religious freedom and like and other uh, other principles and concepts such as human rights, gender and uh, democracy, and I think we're still in the, I would say, the first stage of understanding this concept and the, and the, the, the interesting point that the majority of them found out that there's not any connection between religious freedom and peace building and other uh, uh, like uh, uh, or would support uh, issues such as justice, equality, uh, and inc an inclusive so society. So these uh, are really uh, uh, quite shocking uh, news about Iraq. But uh, uh, this is uh, I say to this point. But having said that, you just uh, we have also a great example in Iraq, uh, and some areas in Iraq made a great. Uh, progress in terms of promoting religious freedom, such as the, the areas such as Iraqi Kurdistan region had a great uh, uh, deal of uh, um, religious freedom in the country, in the, in the, uh, the, in the region. Uh, particularly in 2015, they have, uh, 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 I mean, there's a law about protecting uh, the rights of component in the region, uh, law number five, uh, and this been uh, institutionalized by the religious, uh, by Minister of uh, Endowment and Religious Freedom. So right now they have each uh, component, religious ethnic minority has a, a representative at the ministry, and they have a great uh, level of coordination. So I think if we could uh, set uh, this uh, as an example and uh, we could encourage the government, the central government to follow uh, this example. And uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. I think my time is uh, uh, finished. Oh, thanks a lot. And uh, you'll get a second a second round. Um, I still here. Um, okay, sorry, the the, the practical implications uh, from this, and um, and I think each of you started us down this path and and stopped maybe just short, but given that we have in in the audience, both um, policymakers from from donor agencies, um, Becky, perhaps let's start with you. Um, with uh, uh, I know you have recommendations, but even some some principles to frame those recommendations. Uh, so we'll turn to you um, at this point. No, oh, thank you, Jeremy. I, 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 I hope it's not too much trouble for you to put up those slides again. Well, well, thank you so much. I know you're having internet trouble over there in Iraq, but what we have here are, uh, I'll wait, I'll talk while the slides are coming up. Five principles or charter of principles which the FCDO uh, asked us to prepare to enable us to better in, to to enable faith-based humanitarian organizations to better engage in this field, and um, these are the list 
of principles. And, and Jeremy, uh, feel free to jump in because we, of course, worked on these together. And the first one, of course, is fair and equitable access to funding, which is really to allow faith-based international, national and local providers of humanitarian assistance to be able to compete for funding from governmental, intergovernmental and non-governmental sources on the same basis as any other providers. So the, what if the, the issue was to enable them to have access to funding. And I'll talk very quickly through this. And the second one is respect for the freedom of religion or belief of humanitarian providers. And there's a, you can read about all these chart uh, in detail uh, about these principles in the guidance note, but I, I'll just mention one or two points under each of these principles. And the, under the second principle, Funding can be restricted for humanitarian activities. However, government, intergovernment, and non-governmental organizations must not require a religious provider of humanitarian assistance to alter its form of wider inter internal governance or its constitutive religious principles in order to operate in the humanitarian sphere on an equal basis. So this is about the whole identity of the faith-based humanitarian provider, that they shouldn't be expected to alter their own uh, constitutive religious principles or identity. And the third principle comes to protecting the beneficiaries. No organization should discriminate on an individual on the basis of religion or belief. This is, of course, or, refuse to part or refusal to participate actively in a religious practice. At the same time, the international community must recognize how the particular religious identities, backgrounds, beliefs, and practices of individuals and communities may compound their vulnerability. Furthermore, all humanitarian providers have a grave responsibility to protect the freedom of religion or belief of vulnerable communities and beneficiaries of humanitarian assistance and to render specialized assistance tailored to any significant needs. This is, of course, in line with what we have been discussing over the past uh, almost 45 minutes. The fourth principle is humanitarian purposes. All funding from governmental, intergovernmental, and non-governmental sources to support humanitarian assistance must be used to serve humanitarian purposes. That goes without saying. No funding should be used to support inherently devotional and or proselytizing activities such as worship, sectarian instruction, or proselytism. Finally, adhering to appropriate financial and reporting standards, and this is a very important one because while faith-based organizations must be able to comply with reasonable financial management and reporting standards, donors should not impose excessive and unnecessary bureaucratic barriers that exclude them from access to governmental funding. Now, this is a very important point I want to raise, partly because I, I know this to be particularly true of smaller faith-based humanitarian actors who really do not have the budget to operate on the level that the larger players do. I mean, you need a significant amount of money to be able to produce accounts and to have, not that I'm saying that they shouldn't produce accounts. What it is, is the type of reporting that the heavy bureaucratic hurdles that some of these local faith groups have to jump through in order to access funding is quite prohibitive. So what we are suggesting, or at least the printable is suggesting, is that maybe they should be not, they shouldn't be that excessive. And one must understand that these smaller uh, organizations have got constraints in that respect. So these are the principles, these were developed. And I guess this is a springboard for discussion uh, as well. So thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, Becky. And um, each of those could be unpacked in, in much greater detail. One just brief comment I, I will add um, that has come up even again this week with some
uh, Professor Powers, um, to you for for a few recommendations on from from your comments. Okay, thank you. Make sure I'm unmuted. A uh, couple comments. One, pay more attention to how we need to pay more attention to how religious freedom and peace are joined at the hip. Uh, unfortunately, government scholars, governments, scholars, and NGOs sometimes divide into two camps: those who are focused on religious freedom and those who are focused on religion, conflict, and peace building. Now, clearly, religious freedom is a precondition for religious entities like Catholic Relief Service, which, which I work closely with, to continue to play a leading role in achieving the SDG goals through their relief development, healthcare, and education programs. Um, religious freedom, though, is especially uh, important for the ability of religious entities to promote human rights, peace, and reconciliation. And that includes the religious freedom to play a role in public life, uh, to take a, a public role, not a, not a political role, hopefully, but a public role. And governments and NGOs have to be careful not to promote a Western secularist model that sometimes marginalizes or privatizes religion and makes the public square a religious, a religion free zone. Um, but religious freedom doesn't automatically contribute to religious peace building. Religious freedom is necessary, but not sufficient. Religious freedom can be misused in ways that contribute to conflict and injustice rather than to peace and reconciliation. Therefore, the work of religious entities, governments, NGOs is not done once religious freedom is guaranteed. And I think more attention, so I think more attention should be paid to the ways religious freedom and religious peace building interact. Secondly, some of the most interesting and creative religious peace building is done by faith-based development agencies or local social service organizations. These organizations have developed creative standalone peace building programs, but they recognize that their greatest impact often can come when they integrate peace building into their bread and butter programs of relief development, healthcare, and education. So just as the buzzword in academia is interdisciplinary and the Global Fragility Act seeks to take a whole of government approach, development agencies recognize the need for integration. And we see this in the way USAID, UN, UNDP, and faith-based organizations have incorporated conflict sensitivity into their programs. A conflict sensitive approach allows them to design programs in ways that help bridge the communal divides and help change dynamics that contribute to exclusion and scapegoating, erode social trust and gender conflict. They're also gender sensitive, which is really important since women and girls are often most adversely impacted by communal conflicts and they often play an outsized role in peace building that is sometimes uh, ignored or untapped. Third, the U.S. government can institutionalize its capacity to understand and engage complex religious dynamics, um, especially with respect to conflict and peace, uh, in several ways. Um, you know, there is at least some expertise on religion and conflict in various parts of the Department of State, USAID, the Central Intelligence Agency, and elsewhere, but it's piecemeal and limited. Uh, just as every bureau and embassy is expected to have expertise on politics, economics, culture, and security issues, they should be expected to have expertise in religious dynamics related to the particular country, region, or issue that they're working on. And that requires targeted hiring of specialists in religion, training programs that go beyond the, the good but limited current programs that focus on training in religious freedom, and career paths for those who specialize in religion and religious dynamics. Finally, let me end on a, with a couple of positive examples of government engagement with religion. Um, in Colombia, the Department of State's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations has supported the Barometer Project, which is the official entity tasked with monitoring implementation of the 2016 Peace Accord. And because the Catholic Church's broad credibility in Colombian society and its ubiquitous role in virtually all aspects of the peace process, that barometer project is hosted by Caritas Colombia, an agency of the Colombian Bishops Conference and the Kroc Institute where I work is, it runs the program. Um, that's an example of uh, support for an intra, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an official 
it's it's not an intro, it's not a Catholic bishops project, but the Catholic bishops host the project um, because of their particular role. Um, with the support of USAID, the Central African Interfaith Peace Building Partnership work with communities devastated by intercommunal violence in the Central African Republic. And through a program called Ida Na Ida, or People to People, trauma healing workshops in the Labaye Prefecture help children and adults heal and promote social cohesion within and between the sharply divided Christian and Muslim communities. And in 20, 2005 and 2011, USAID supported a much more extensive people to people peace process in South Sudan, which was led by faith-based organizations working with the Sudan Council of Churches. I could mention some other examples, but, but those are a couple I think that uh, reflect the kind of positive, sophisticated engagement with religious actors that I'm uh, suggesting we need more of. Thank you. Great. All of those are, are very useful and practical suggestions. Uh, let's turn now to Salah. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, uh, basically, I just I didn't want to generalize the situation in Iraq, and it's really wrong, both in academic and uh, in uh, like practical or just implementing project. It's really difficult to generalize because right now Iraq we have in Iraq we have three mm, regions, and the, each region has own like different uh, areas with own specification and. Uh, so I think in terms of uh, uh, when I when I just because my topic was mainly more was about the religious freedom. I think uh, that the point is that uh, in order to enhance the aspect of religious freedom in Iraq, I believe we need a holistic approach rather than just uh, focusing on one point. Um, so for that reason, I think uh, uh, the the. Uh, you know that uh, religion uh, just occupy a significant space in our in people life, mainly in the Middle East and I believe maybe more in Iraq. Uh, uh, so I think it's important to, uh, and uh, this has been mentioned by many people, to involve religious uh, leaders uh, in uh, promoting religious fr religious freedom itself. But the point is that. Uh, uh, sometimes religious leaders themselves became a hurdle, a hurdle of uh, promoting religious freedom in Iraq. So I think in, when we come to a building capacity, like we have lots of organizational works on the, I think we have to pay extra attention to uh, uh, building uh, and educating those religious leaders in order to become a, a key player in the future uh, uh like i mean even the peace building as the uh, professor mentioned uh and uh, the other points that in iraq uh, the the political and the the militia also in the past they used the religious institution as well as a as a method uh, just to uh, meet their ends uh, and uh, to achieve more goals uh, they desire. So I think uh, both the religious leaders and institution uh, should be uh, focused on more by the, the, the international organization and uh, uh, also local organization as well. So th this is one thing. The other one is the, the in terms of the research, I think uh, research and studying and uh, promoting religious freedom in the education system, I think uh, we have a clearly, we, we lack of that aspect. And I think we should involve education in uh, promoting religious freedom. But um, the, the point, as I just mentioned, religious freedom is, as a term is, is new in Iraq and, uh, and uh, uh, we need more work uh, on this uh, point. Also, the role of uh, local organization as well, like uh, religious uh, leaders and religious institution, we don't have uh, very much uh, expertise in this area. So I think it will be great to focus 
on uh, that point as well. I believe USAID and the other international organization have uh, great programs on that. And uh, I believe in, in, in Iraqi case, I think we have to in intensify uh, uh, those efforts. Uh, so I think this is my, I believe there are lots of other points that uh, helps our case uh, in Iraq uh, to promote religious freedom, but uh, I, I rest my case. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much, Salah. Um, for those points. Um, we've had um, a few questions um, that have come in ahead of time. Many of those have been answered, um, but um, maybe one for, um, for Rebecca that was submitted um, related to policymakers who may recognize uh, the value of a religious community ahead of time, but when they fa face persecution, are often prone to say it's not about religion, or it's not about religious persecution. Um, and some of this may come to the question data. Um, and you mentioned some of this, but I wanted to raise, raise this question for you, um, in particular to respond to, and then maybe the others as well. Well, no, thank you, Jeremy. Well, uh, if I if I if I get this correct, the the, the person wants to know. Uh, could you just repeat that question again, Jeremy? Yeah. Good. I I lost you there. Would you would you be able to repeat the question again? Sure. Um, that they are often just will deny that there's a religious dimension to persecution or to violence against a community. They look for other explanatory factors um, and uh, avoid the, the, the role religion might play as a dynamic and how to respond to that. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Thank, thank you very much. Well, that, that, of course, religion, as Professor Powers said, is, is really often one factor in, among many factors. In some cases, it is the driver. In some cases, it's, it's, uh, it's an associated factor. There are other factors. So I'm not, I, I don't think anyone will say that religion is a key factor in, in any crisis or the only factor. It's, a, it's one of many factors. However, I do want to say two, there are two points I'd like to make. One is what I said about the, uh, the, this religion blind spot. Many people believe that religion is actually a problem. And uh, most INGOs, Western INGOs and faith-based INGOs, even in the West, actually regard religion as a problem. And as I said earlier, they, they deal with it reactively. They say they, they don't really integrate it at the beginning, at the, very, at, the, at, the, at the outset, at the front end of an issue. They want to deal with it. They, they, see, they see religion as you know, it's a problem. It's something that isn't really the issue. People are just making a big deal about it. And a lot of this has got to do also with data. Um, a few months ago, I remember speaking to a, a very high ranking policymaker who said that when she was dealing with freedom or religion or belief, she came from a development background and there was not good data on religious restrictions. And, um, Someone said that a particular conflict, and she was talking about the Baram Fulani conflict in northern Nigeria, that was a development issue. It wasn't a religious issue. It wasn't a freedom of religion or belief issue. And she said, well, what was I to say? Because I didn't have the freedom of religion or belief or the religious freedom statistics to back me up. So in some senses, it also leads back to my other point about there needing to be data, which is why we have a project, which is a smart survey, which we started at the Religious Freedom Project and uh, at the Religious Freedom Institute, which collects, you know, disaggregated, granular data, real time, sort of simple, meaningful, uh, uh, adaptable, uh, uh, real time, uh, reliable, uh, uh, timely data that enables us to make these decisions and say, you know, is this, this is a religion issue and have the data to back it up.
great. Yeah, that the need for data is important to inform inform approaches and inform policies. Um, as we draw to a close, I want to invite uh, first maybe Professor Powers. Any any final comments from you, um, as well as perhaps resources we might point uh, people to for to engage farther with your work. Uh, well, let me. I've, I've talked a lot about. Uh, what governments can do. Um, I should note that, you know, I, I coordinate the, as I said, the Catholic Peace Building Network, and and our focus is mainly on, you know, what, what our own community can do better. Um, the, I think the Catholic community is doing remarkable work on peace, peace building around the world, but it's also sometimes part of the problem, and in many cases, it's it's not even coming close to fulfill its own, fulfill its, fulfill its capacity uh, to be a peace builder. Um, and so uh, that's why I felt one reason I think it's really important to look at intra-religious peace building because I think the same is true of many uh, faith entities is that we we have enormous capacity but we aren't always using it uh, to its fullest. And sometimes governments uh, can uh, contribute to that and, and certainly foundations and NGOs can, can work with religious entities to help them develop their capacity. Um, and the key is simply to make sure that it's uh, that that you respect the legitimate autonomy and and legitimate mechanisms of those uh, individual religious entities as you help them to support to develop their own capacities. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And. and Salah, any final comments? Yes, uh, thank you. Just briefly, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the religious and faith community occupy a quite unique and specific role uh, in our, uh, I mean, have uh, unique and specific roles and function in our society. And uh, I think uh, religion uh, as a social fact, uh, uh, I believe, has a strong impact on many lives and to wider society. I think, therefore, uh, religions need to be taken seriously uh, uh, and could be both as a source of good and bad and uh, dealt with accordingly. But uh, unfortunately, in the countries that the rule of law is just uh, really weak, and uh, I think the, the, the bad stuff will will uh, crop up uh, i mean sooner than the the uh, good stuff so i think uh, we have to be uh, as as it is i mean religions as a a, a, a potential opportunity uh, for personal harmony deeper meaning social caring and uh, and just the values other values at the same time uh, there are possibilities for misinterpret misinterpreting uh, religion text and that may just uh, become a pitfall you know uh, as a uh, professor uh, mentioned in the pitfall in the process of peace building in Iraq uh, uh, right now and in other countries as well I think so we have to be really careful on addressing those issues and uh, finding a practical solution for it otherwise uh, it'll be really uh, more difficult down the road so yeah thank you very much Great. Well, thanks to each of you for, for joining me today. Um, and there's much more to discuss, which um, will come to in future conversations, I'm sure. Um, do follow us at rfi.org. Uh,